The last thing you want to do is make a decision in crisis. But if you're paying attention to the environment you're in, in a very methodical way, you are undoubtedly ready to react in the way that you should and that you trained your brain to. That is the distinguishing difference between just observation and true situational awareness. I'm Clint Emerson, retired Navy SEAL, 21 years combat experience all over the globe, and now a crisis management professional. My years of service consisted of both SEAL teams at the theater level and the national level. I had the opportunity of working in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other parts of the globe. I like to sometimes compare things to the Jedbergs of World War II, where guys would go in, small coalition forces, if you will, as an American, a Brit, and usually a Frenchman, and they go in behind enemy lines and do sabotage and other things to try and defeat the Nazis. So a modern day version of that is probably a good explanation without actually telling you what's going on. Our brains rely on being challenged. The benefits of just being situational aware besides observing and making decisions based on what you're presented with is one way to exercise your mind and learn how to be more attentive, how to pay attention to the small things. You'll find that your memory starts to get a little bit better because you're doing it more often, not just with the things you're paying attention to, but remembering your grocery list all of a sudden becomes a little easier. And you start noticing the little things about people and their mannerisms. Our pattern of life is really small. It's home, it's work, then to our favorite restaurant. If you take the time to evaluate the routes in between and those establishments, you've just reduced the number of things you have to pay attention to when something bad occurs. Let's look at situational awareness presented in the movie Born Identity. I'm not making this up. These are real. No operative would store all his passports together in one big pile. <laughs> it's just, that's a little out there. I can tell you the license plate numbers of all six cars outside. I can tell you that our waitress is left-handed and the guy sitting up at the counter weighs 215 pounds and knows how to handle himself. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would factor this more on the side of hypervigilance. Also probably in some aspects a little extraordinary. Most people aren't capable of that. You know, just from my observations, there was four cars in the parking lot, there wasn't a truck, and the guy at the bar was not in that great a shape. <laughs> but I think this clip is a great representation for situational awareness and kind of defining it. It shows the capability of maybe a couple of people <laughs> that I know, but could an average person train to memorize and take in that much information and actually analyze it and interpret it to a limited degree. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it, just like with anything. All right, so imagine this is your house. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at it from a safety and security point of view. Ideally in every home or every place you go or you spend time, you designate a safe area for the family to consolidate in a time of an emergency. And in this home, for example, the stairs are a great place. It's centrally located. The walls do not share any outside walls. You could even put water, food, and other forms of communication in that spot. You have windows, all right? As we know in natural disaster, windows are bad. But identifying your windows now you're seeing kind of a common thread of exit strategies. You've got the main door here, and then you've got really nothing down below that stands out. If you need to exit, we're gonna go out these windows. And once we get done doing this, we're gonna see pretty much where the home's dead ends are. So if there's an emergency, going to the backside back here, this is probably no-go because there's no other way out. Into this master bedroom suite, it looks like there's nothing there. So you kind of get the point. Once you really start concentrating on your points of entry and then all of your windows, now you know parts of your home that are kind of like off limits when a crisis occurs. The OODA loop, or O-O-D-A, is a tool you can use to help sift through the environments you're in. Observation, orientate yourself, decide, and then act. One thing that happens in a crisis is your fine motor skills go out the window, you have no time, and you have high stress. That is why it's so important to make your decisions in a more clinical setting, where I have plenty of time, 
and you're running those scenarios. And the more you do that, the more you train your brain to come up with really good decisions because you're doing it while you're calm. Now, if something happens, all you're gonna do is act it out. So let's say this is where I go to work every day. So this is part of a multi-level building and we are not on the first floor. We've got several elevator banks right here, here, here. These elevator banks basically become useless in a time of disaster. They usually shut down immediately and you're forced to use stairs. In an emergency, we know that we're gonna probably concentrate our efforts of exit to these stairs, especially if it's a fire. Most people don't know it, but most of your stairwells have their own HVAC and positive pressure systems. So once you're in there, it actually protects you from the bad air that may be going on here. A secondary option, we've got so many windows, and in times of disaster, you wanna stay away from glass. But if there was a fire, you could probably get away with throwing a chair through the window and escaping that way if you're a reasonable distance up. So I'd say safely, if you're in reasonable shape, could jump from three stories and be okay. Heck, you might break a leg, but that's better than uh, whatever the consequences are up here in this space. It's also important to keep in mind that as it relates to fires, a lot of trucks, ladders only extend 120 feet max. Just good information to know in extreme situations. I break down awareness and what I call total awareness into four big pieces, and that's personal awareness, cultural awareness, third-party awareness, and then situational awareness. The first one is personal awareness. When we talk about threat reduction, you have to know what you look like to others. So the next piece is cultural awareness, and that's really knowing the do's and don'ts of the geographical area that you're gonna be visiting. So third-party awareness is really just knowing that we have people all around us that can look at us, judge us, and potentially gonna find your vulnerabilities and exploit them in some varying form. The last one is the big one, situational awareness. Cataloging the environment, sifting through it, and then confirming what's good and what's bad. So now we're in a restaurant. All right, so we know that there are one, two, three, four exit and entry points here. I'm probably gonna come inside, probably step to the left, step to the right, but stay out of the way of that doorway. The doorways are known as fatal funnels. When I look at a crowd of people, I wonder to myself, all right, if everybody was to get up right now and run out of here because of a natural disaster or whatever, where would they all go? the doorway that I'm standing near. Then as I get seated, they walk us over and this is where we're gonna end up seeing. Immediately, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the restroom, mainly so that now I can identify, is this a good route out? Is there any doors down here? Um, and then of course, there's always the exit in the kitchen that you never see, but is always there. As I come back out, sit down, I can cover at least here, field of view, and then here with the doors. Active shooters, unfortunately, are a reality. One of the things I promote the most as far as what you can kind of run through, to keep it really simple, it's run, hide, fight. The run, if uh, you increase distance from the shooter, then you increase survivability. When you run, ideally you wanna run from cover to cover. Never follow the herd. Take a moment and see if you can truly identify the shooter. So trust your eyes, question your ears when it comes to gunshots. Now, looking at exit strategies, the majority of the people may run to the door that they came in. That's gonna be natural instinct. Some are probably gonna head over to this fire exit door, and some are probably gonna to go towards that patio door if it's a big slider. And very few people are probably gonna to go to the kitchen. I'll be able to see what's coming at me and then be able to react accordingly using the kitchen door. Hide, what would I hide behind that stops bullets? Oh, structural pillars, the big planter that's out in front of my office, vehicles. You'll hear about people hiding in a closet or hiding in a bathroom. If you're gonna hide in a dead end and make sure it's a room that has furniture that you can stack in front of that door. And the proper way to barricade when you're hiding is to stack in front of the door all the way to the opposing wall. Now you're using the wall as the brace against the door and no one's gonna open it. Right off the bat, I know that this bar is probably built pretty well. So if you need to take cover, 
You can cover back behind here. And then if you roll into fight mode, the utensils on your table, salt and pepper burns the eyes. You've got loose chairs everywhere that you could potentially throw at the guy. Anything you need to do to create pain or create distraction so that you can escape. So then when we talk about the fight or the defend, you've gotta be far more aggressive than the person coming at you if you wanna win. So here we have a collection of objects that can be readily found around the globe. So all of these can be used as self-defense tools. And let's start with the roll of quarters. A roll of quarters, if just by gripping it alone, increases the density of your fist, making it a little bit harder. If you add it to a sock, just by dropping it in there, you just created an improvised sap. A fist typically flies at roughly 25 miles an hour. By adding your quarters to a sap, now you're increasing upwards to about 40 to 50 miles an hour. Eight ounce fishing weights, we're putting in a handkerchief. Let gravity keep it in place. And once again, it's an improvised sap. This one, because it's got more weight than a roll of quarters, you're increasing its velocity upwards to 55, 60 miles an hour. And that's just the average person. Books. A couple of them will, by themselves, will stop most handgun rounds by adding ceramic tiles. What ceramic does and what's unique to it is that it displaces the energy of the round as soon as it hits. If you wanted to make some improvised body armor, you could take two books and you could either throw in your tiles on the inside, like so, or you could throw them in between the two books, like so. All right. The two books and adding ceramic tiles will stop most rounds, regardless of whether it's handgun or rifle. Impact, it'll displace it, and very rarely will it penetrate through the second book if you've got that many tiles in place. Okay, so that's improvised body armor. So steel barrel pens are awesome. A steel barrel pen acts as a great puncture tool. All right, so salt and pepper. All right, first and foremost, this certainly is everywhere around the world. Salt and pepper both burn the eyes. Don't think for a second that you can't take a moment, pull some out, put it in your hands, and use it to your advantage. A newspaper nail bat. So if you've got a newspaper that's, uh, yeah, I'd say 10 pages or more, you spread it out just as I did, as you can see, as it's a square. And then the idea is to roll it as tight as possible. And then you fold it back on itself, your best friend, duct tape. So the fold, it becomes hard as a rock up here at the end. Once again, all of this is used to either defend yourself or create pain so that you can then escape and get away. I believe awareness is 100% teachable. If you're walking or driving that same route every day, if you're sitting in the same office or cubicle every day, then identifying these things really isn't a big deal. Applying the, the situation awareness starts to fine tune more of the human interaction. It helps work the brain and give it something new to do and learn, increase your cognitive levels, your ability to retain information, and then to be able to pull that information when you need it. You're gamifying it, and while you're doing it, you're actually you know, increasing your safety and security.